Hello, I'm Rich Terring, and having a baby has made me look old and fat. Uh, <laughs> because that's what I am. She's over here. Hello, Phoebe. I'm looking after her at the moment. She's playing a little piano there. I hope you can hear that. She's very talented for a 12-week-old child. Anyway, welcome to another Retro Rehearsal. The furthest one's with Shappy Kasandi. If you enjoy these videos of Rich Terring's Leicester Square Theatre podcast... We are hoping to film Series 7, but we need some money to do that. It costs £30,000 to film the whole series. We've set up a Kickstarter. There's lots of uh, rewards, starting very simple things with badges, leading right up to owning an episode and being able to advertise yourself or uh, take the piss out of your friends or have me take the piss out of your friends or yourself or whatever at the start. Go to the Kickstarter page to find out all about that. Probably be somewhere around there. You know, I haven't put the graphic on yet. You're not stupid. You know, that goes on later. Uh, and uh, it'd be terrific if you could just give any a little amount of money. We only really need about a thousand people in total to give us something, and um, so far we've had over 500. So we're, we're over halfway there with 15 days to go, but there's still a long way to go. So contribute if you can. We want to keep it free if you can't. So if you can't afford to pay a pound, then we really want you to have this for nothing. Um, and also, I'm still on tour. Uh, in the coming week, I'm going to Shrewsbury. Stockton, Leeds, and Peterborough, and also the DVD record of Lord of the Dance City is coming up at the Bloomsbury Theatre on the 15th of May. I'm also there on the 14th of May if you don't want to be filmed. So uh, be terrific, terrific if you come along to one of those. But, you know, you know whatever, you probably fast-forwarded through this. You're the kind of person who's fast-forwarded through this bit because you didn't know there would be a joke in it. What's brand taps at your window? A poo on stilts. See, so all the people who fast forwarded through missed that, and yeah, do you enjoy that, Phoebe? No. Da, 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 da. I'm quietly going insane, but it's nice being a dad. And um, sorry, I'm talking, what a mess. I've got so little respect for you. I'm. So, I apologise. Enjoy Richard Herring's That's the Square Theatre Podcast. Like my dressing gown. Oh yeah. Ah, oh, it's all gone wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Leicester Square Theatre. Please welcome a man who has been making crystal meth in a pumpkin, uh, the very special ingredient. It's Richard Herring! Thank you! It's not blue, I'll tell you that. It's not blue. It's creamy. So, um, <laughs> welcome to re another series. It's series four of Richard Herring's Leicester Square Theatre Podcast, or as all the cool kids are calling it, a Hellestopper. <laughs> and tell we're here at the Leicester Square Theatre. It's uh, kind of, there's a few people in. There's a few empty seats at the back there. We've got uh, some of the usual suspects, nuclear physicist, Thomas Horton, uh, the butlers are here. Just a couple of new, with a new guy. What's going on with you? All good looking. <laughs> what's, what's your name? James, what do, you, what do you do, James? Are you a male model? Just here, just when you come and sit in this room, just as a normal looking man, suddenly you just look gorgeous, you just look gorgeous. Look at that guy behind you. Ah! Oh, look how good looking he is compared if you sit with a ah! Ah! Uh, no, I mean, even you look quite good compared to this row of freaks. Always hang around. That's always just, if you're not that good looking, just find three blokes. Worse looking than you. That is my. So, what, what do you do for a living? I'm a postman. You're a postman. Oh, yeah. How's it going with all the, the sell-off of the? Are you going to get some free shares? Yeah. What are you going to do with the shares? You're going to sell them and just take the money? Or are you going to hold on to them? Uh, well, I can't sell them for the first two years. Oh, can you not? So you're going to hold on to them for two years. Could you tell the people at the post office that to? I'm, I'm worried about the share deal because the bloke who posts the post in my street doesn't know what numbers are. <laughs> That's what worries me. I get, I get mail for the people who live next door, two, day, two, two doors along. Could you have a word with him? You know where I, you know where I live. Uh, so, <laughs> you all do. Uh, anyway, um, we're here. I've had, uh, it's been, we've had a little bit of time, haven't we, since we were last here, so a few things have happened. I was, uh, I was in Armenia uh, last week with uh, David Badil. As my dad calls him, David Badil, so that... We had to, we're doing a show, it's kind of an odd show for Dave, where we had to spend £8,000 in a 24-hour period. 
Um, it's kind of an odd job to get in Armenia. Uh, it was quite good fun. We tried to redistribute it to, to the local people, but they didn't really charge very much money for anything, so it was hard to get rid of stuff. So we ended up staying in the presidential suite in a hotel for four hours. That's all we could afford, actually, for four hours, which is kind of amazing. And we only found out later that President Assad of Syria had once stayed in the, in the same suite, which I think would t- cast a different light over our antics. We were sort of jumping around on the bed with money all over the bed. <laughs> I, th- I wanted to do I said, that'd be really fun, Dave. We just got the money and just threw it on a bed and jumped around. And David Bedell said, can we get some girls to join us? I said, no, that will not. That won't be funny, David. That will be... It'll only be funny if it's you and me. So we were rolling around. We tried to ring uh, room service at this hotel. It's terrible being rich. I've never been rich. Uh, and uh, I've never been able to do this. You get treated really badly. We're in the presidential suite of a hotel. We rang down to get some champagne and some caviar. Uh, and the bloke on the room service went, we went can we have some caviar? He went, oh. <laughs> so, can we, can, someone, can we get two lots of cabbage? Yeah. <laughs> and a bottle of champagne. And then I said, well, I was trying to spend as much money as possible, so I said, can we get some cigarettes? And he said, can we get some Dunhill cigarettes? And he went, wow, well, what colour? So I, don't, I don't know. But he was really rude to us. It was fantastic. I've never been treated so bad. Then he rang up about five minutes later and said, we don't have any caviar. Uh, so <laughs> we were screwed. So that was, that was worth uh, doing. And uh, the director of that programme had a very odd phobia, uh, which I've never come across, which I would say working in the entertainment industry would be an odd thing. She was scared of... Uh, she had a phobia and fainted, passed out, if she saw uh, anything that was oversized on what you would expect it to be. <laughs> So basically any statue, yeah. Uh, I said, I better not get my cock out. Because uh, I didn't, because that would have been uh, sexual harassment. Uh, so, uh, uh, but if like any uh, statue or any like mainly cartoon, if you, she once saw Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble in T- Tottenham Court Road, obviously people dressed up in big costumes and then fainted. And then concerned, Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble came up to her. And then she fainted again, because... They came to that's kind of an odd that you would think that would be a handicap in, uh, in working in show business. And there were lots of statues around, it was quite good fun. Sort of lead. It was like being in the in nightmare, trying to lead her around. <laughs> Go, watch out, don't look left now. The gigantic blue bird. Uh, so, um, and uh, I've just been at the Amalfi Coast as well. I've been trying, I'm an in, internet, international jet setter with my wife. Uh, uh, and the, the Amalfi Coast uh, taught me that if life gives you lemons, Uh, What you do is you make a sickly sweet liqueur out of them that you then sell to tourists uh, who, knowing that when they get home, uh, they will, uh, no, it will it will taste horrible because they're no longer in the sunshine and it will taste of nothing but lost happiness. (laughs) That's what you do if life gives you lemons. uh, And... uh... My favourite thing that happened uh, at the Amalfi Coast, though, uh, we saw lots of amazing things. We went to Herculaneum and Pompeii. But on the way back from Herculaneum, um, the train was just pulling out of the station. And in the sidings of the railway, in the middle of the day, so it was 3.30, I saw a grey-haired man being vigorously blown by a brown-haired woman. And I... Just, in the, just by the side of the railway. It was a fucking amazing thing. <laughs> <laughs> See, and it was so hot. I mean, it was blindingly hot, but I mean, I don't know if that's what they thought is so hot that no one will be able to see us. <laughs> but uh, it was just completely in the open. I mean, they were hiding from anyone in the town, but anyone who went past in a train uh, could see them. He did have his, uh, his back to the tracks, the man. You know, he's an exhibitionist, but there's no need to show off about it, is there? Uh, there's a possibility she was just trying to loosen his belt, I suppose. But if she was doing that, she was doing it incredibly vigorously, and I would say using the wrong part of her anatomy. Me to, to do it, but uh, you know, I, I mean, I made a judgment. I guessed that that was a prostitute and an old man, but they may have may have been a kind of May to December love affair going on there. They just couldn't hold on themselves anymore. We can't make a judgment. I found it weirdly life affirming seeing this. It was so in. You know, it was the middle of the afternoon. Most old men would be having a siesta. This guy was grasping the moment, <laughs> and she was grasping something as well, and. Uh, <laughs> and I found that quite life affirming, quite hopeful. And these people live in the shadow of Mount Vesuvius. It could explode at any moment, destroy everything. They're just every second they have to make the most of. And they say fight fire with fire. Uh, so maybe you fight eruptions with loads and loads of small eruptions. And that might. But I was getting... if they did, if they did. Uh... If they did, uh, the, if the volcano did go off at that point, they were coated as the people of Pompeii were and Herculaneum. I'd love to be an archaeologist digging that up afterwards, filling, <laughs> filling up that gap with plaster of Paris, discovering 
what they are up to. That's, that's the way to live, I tell you. So look, we've, uh, we've had a lot of fun. <laughs> had a lot of fun here doing adverts. Oh, we're going to put that out of the way, on it's up there. Uh, and um, and uh, James is here, he's a postman. Very good looking postman. <laughs> are, you, are you with James? Yeah. She's your wife. Yeah, he's done well with a postcard postman. <laughs> Get free stamps, don't you, as well? And a gorgeous husband. What do you, what's your name? Karen. And what do you, what do you do, Karen? You're a musician. Why are you going out with a postman? You could be with a, like a stand-up comedian or something cool. Uh, there's still time. There's my, that's my wife there. Uh, so, uh, hello. Favour the people at home. It's the... <laughs> I'm going to carry on with the show. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm in trouble already. I'm in trouble, Karen, uh, with my wife. It's the, the, the series four has only just begun. Uh, so, uh, my first guest is waking, waiting behind the curtain. She is probably best known for her appearance on Never Mind the Full Stops, the BBC Four panel show about punctuation. <laughs> Will you please welcome Shappy Sandy, ladies and gentlemen. This is it. There she is. Hello. Very good. Sit down. You can take your, you can take your uh, microphone out of there, or you can leave it in, whatever you like. I t I'll take it out. Let's, like should we move the, Should I move this? Yeah, move it out of the way so everyone can see. There's nothing between us now. There's Love. two men right in the corner there. Like the, like, you're like the two old men in the Muppet show. There, like, <laughs> I feel scared. I've got my back to you. Sorry. We can see them there. This is the beauty of this. I can film them. It doesn't there. They're a bit too far away to see. So they do look like the Muppets. Uh, do you remember much about uh, Never Mind the, the Full Stops? <laughs> I, I got this incredible fondness for it when you... Um, Did you? When you mentioned it. Because at first I thought you were going to say, uh, Never Mind the Buzzcocks. Yeah. And, I, and I got that comedian sort of slight, sort of bitter... No, actually, I've never been booked for that one. <laughs> um, but Never Mind the Full Stops. I thought, oh, yes, of course, charming programme. That was 379 years ago I did that. It was, well, I did it as well, I have to say. I did, I, I did a, an episode of it, not the same one as you. No, I uh, was on Julie, It was hosted by Julian Fellows, who, well, there's lots of flies uh, in today, which is very exciting for Sorry. the insect based viewers. We, there's a lot of viewers <laughs> aroused by flies. Um, the ties are gnats chuff. So, um, <laughs> little back ref, 20 years there. Uh, but uh, Julian Fellows, who went on to write Downton Abbey, was the host. I'm not just going to talk about it, never mind the full stop. <laughs> oh, it's going well, to be I the could first 20, 20, 20 25 a... minutes. Uh, he, wrote, he, he wrote Downton Abbey, so he doesn't do Never Mind the Full Stops anymore. It was such a cunty programme. I've never, <laughs> I've never been... It was like, it was genuinely like, um, when I did it, uh, for, Vanessa Feltz was one of the guests, and she was really swatty. And I think they'd had, we'd had all the questions in advance, but I hadn't read... I was it a Radio 4 show? Or, no, it was a BBC TV programme. It was BBC like BBC four. 4 or something like that. When BBC 4 was first invented, and yeah. then it was all exciting, because it was about literature and punctuation. Yeah. But it was and so specific. And I know a bit about punctuation and grammar, and I found it much too difficult. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to do an Obama in a minute and get that. Oh. There's so many flies around you. Oh, I hit it the third time. It's uh, going to give but, you some uh, money then. He was so pompous, Junior Fellows, and I didn't like him at all. I'd met him oh. a week before and liked him, and then I saw him again, and he was really horrible. Right. And at the end, as we were doing the retakes, he, I did something wrong. He went, oh dear, how embarrassing. And I said, oh, fuck off. <laughs> Uh, knowing that they wouldn't use that, but well, he um, yeah. When I when I when I think back upon my career, Richard, there's so many people I wish I'd told to fuck off. Yeah. But but just didn't have the bollocks to, and I, and I wish I could go back now. And so I'm delighted that I can come here on your podcast and say, Andrew Green of Migration Watch, fuck right <laughs> off, fuck all the way off. My Migration Watch. What's yeah. That? Is that right. like a human migration or animal migration? Is that the UK? Program. Well, you know, he would regard it as animal migration. <laughs> I imagine. No, he was frightfully posh and ever such a nice man. And it was my first, probably one of my first ever TV things. Um, and it was about going on a, a serious debate program talking about immigration. Right. Because for about 3,000 years, the only things I was ever asked to do ever was something to do with immigration or from being Iranian. And I've been Iranian for ages. <laughs> um, but I am starting to get booked for sort of non-Iranian stuff, which is really exciting um, for me. And um, Put away all the Iranian... 
pancake making stuff we've got backstage. Oh, have you hired? Yeah, so I haven't done really much research there. Pancake Uranium making pan- stuff. They mainly make pancakes. That's what they mainly do. <laughs> Sorry, carry on. I was expecting a whirling dervish. <laughs> That's not an exclusively Iranian thing. Um, yeah, and I, I had this big bag. And as we walked into the studio, Clive Anderson was presenting it. Right. Was it Clive Anderson or the other one? Anyway, a Clive. And uh, Mr. Migration Watch went, oh, that bag's very big. Is that where you keep your bomb? Oh. I know. <laughs> I know. And then, the, do you know, the worst thing is when, when someone's rude to you like that and, and uh, insulting like that, it... It kind of pulls the rug out from under your feet, so I didn't deal with it. You're not expecting people to be cunty. Yeah. So I went like this. Oh, God, grow up. <laughs> that was my comeback, right? If that had been Joe Brand, she would have had him sacked. She would have got in the papers with that shit. Oh, and then grew up. <laughs> like this. And then I was on this um, a sitcom pilot. Sorry, I'm no, venting. Right. Is this no, all right? That's good, I like it. I was on this... Um, it's died well. I was on this uh, sitcom pilot... Uh, and it went to, to series, but they cut my character out. Um, I was playing... Anyway, never mind. But <laughs> the son... I think it was the son of the casting director. was a seven-year-old boy. And we are all chatting at lunchtime. And this seven-year-old boy said to me, Oh, shut up! And I felt so sorry for him. Because he said it right in front of his father, the casting director. And I thought, oh, poor kid's going to get really told off, Right. And his dad said, oh, well, I think Shafi's used to men talking to her like that where she's from. <laughs> Richard, I didn't tell him to fuck off. Tell him to fuck I off. didn't hit the kid. Tell and the I kid didn't to fuck to off to... first. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening, Mr. Casting Director Man, I remember your name. I'm not saying it out loud, but seriously, fuck right off. <laughs> can we start now? We can, yeah, that's good. That was the, that was the Julian fellow. I, I'm, I looked at the IM... You're on the IMDB thing for Never Mind the Full Stops. And I am not, which makes me wonder whether they didn't even show my episode. Uh, so maybe I... Maybe I maybe makes me wonder what IMBD is. Uh, it's the, uh, it's uh, very useful for this show. It's just, ah. It just lists all the TV shows and films okay. that anyone's ever like been in. It, like That's where I do my research for that bit. There's a little behind the scenes in the director's studio. With, well, where I get my first joke from is going through imdb.com and looking for the most obscure thing. You didn't have much. There was okay. a few things. I didn't see Migration Watch. <laughs> Some things they don't put on there. Um, I did a show called uh, Best Man Speech for ITV2, which I've never seen, which was called to mind a little bit when I was doing this show last week in Armenia because it's a similarly kind of weird concept. Uh, it's not even listed on IMDb at all, that TV programme. So well, when you say you never saw it, was it something you did? Because I, sometimes I do some things yeah. for TV, and I just walk away from it. Yes, I did that. I don't look back, I just walk away. <laughs> did anyone see Best Man Speech, the ITV2, or might be an ITV3 <laughs> programme? And anyone see it? No one saw it, it's wonderful. I got paid more for two days' work than I've ever been paid for anything before, <laughs> and nobody saw it. It was the perfect... Those gamble. are the best jobs. <laughs> Those are the best. It was, jobs, well, it was. It sounded like quite a good proud. I don't want to just talk about my own terrible TV career, but let, <laughs> we started doing. It was a. It was sound like a good premise in which it was saying, you know, we have got some best men, and you know, we're going to get some comedians to come oh, in to coach to them. coach them to do their wedding speeches. So, well, that might be quite interesting, and you can have an idea, you know, help them through that. And that might be quite a useful program for other people because people often email me and ask me for jokes and stuff for best man speeches. Uh, but then they just kind of did, made us do really stupid things. Like the, f- the first day, the guy had pretended he'd broken his arms and, and on, by the Thames and had to stop people and ask him to help him scratch his nose or something. You know, not really going to mm. help that much. It was me- this is meant to give him confidence. Uh, and, then, and then we just went to an old people's home and they did some jokes to old people for no real reason. Oh, that's it always was, upsetting. It was just bad. It's like doing it gigs in corridors, isn't it? Yeah. It's like when you just have to stand there. I've done, you know, when, um, when TV first came out, and uh, they would get comics who, who were kind of starting out, and they'd excite you by, and then you're, uh, by saying, oh, this thing's going to be on TV. And your agent would be like, yes, go out, do anything, do anything. And I remember going around Ealing Broadway Shopping Centre and going up to Ealing Cafes and doing my routine and thinking this is really going to progress my career. And I spent all day doing this in the cafe, in the library. And then I just remember walking along the South Bank and had this hidden camera, like, miles away, and I had to do my set. And somewhere in the world is this thing of me walking along, talking to myself and... People looking at that Let's game, hope so. never... <laughs> if no one was actually filming it. 
That's, that's why, when I got, because this, this programme I did last week was so weird. The premise is such an odd premise, and you kind of think, is that for real? And then I got to the airport at like five o'clock in the morning on a Monday, uh, and I looked for the flight on the, on the things, on the displays, and it wasn't there, which is never... Exp so I thought, am I in the wrong airport? Am I in the wrong terminal? Uh, is this just a trick? Is the programme actually let's make com greedy comedians look like idiots <laughs> by making them get up really early and go, no, there wasn't a show. Oh, well, <laughs> wait, did you get... See, the, thing, the, things that I'm, the horrors that I'm talking about wasn't even paid for. No. It was back when TV was first invented and they'd go, do this thing for TV for free, and you'd go, OK, I'll walk around and do some gigs, gags to some mud. We have done some good stuff as well. Well, you have, but I, I haven't. In fact, um, <laughs> you've done like Live at the Apollo, which is, you know, similar. It's very similar to doing this show. Uh, a, lot, a lot of comedians see it as the same thing. And uh, uh, Ben Evans, who uh, asked the question to Stephen Fry that made Stephen Fry crack open like a... Uh, like a walnut kind of, at some Christmas. Kind of, yeah, some kind of... A walnut that had tried to kill itself the previous Christmas. <laughs> yes, I read about this. Beautiful. Uh, uh, very like that. Um... Uh, he has got some questions for you, and the, one of them refers to Live at the Apollo. On Live at the Apollo... Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Sorry, before we talk. Yeah. There's one Live at the Apollo I did that I really like, and right. two that I cringe at. Okay. I think and... this is more general. OK, oh, sorry. So I don't think he's going to... I didn't need to share that, then. On Live at the Apollo, one of your performances was pathetic. I, <laughs> even as an 11-year-old Welsh boy, I found it, <laughs> I found it embarrassing. Well, he's, got, he's grown up a little bit and become harsh. He's, got, he's into his teenagers. He's a little Welsh boy. Should I do it in a Welsh accent? Uh, is, is he really oh, written that? Alive at the Apollo. <laughs> what does it look like? <laughs> well, it's, it's very good. This is uh, a very specific kind of You're accent. a voice com comedian am, yeah. like yeah. me. What does it feel like when you're standing behind the massive sign with Live at the Apollo written on it? It feels like my life is going to be shorter than it was meant to be without that. Yeah. It is the most nerve-wracking thing ever. The first one that I did, um, I'm really happy with. Um, and part of the reason I feel that I gave such a good performance is that just before I was about to go on, I went for a last-minute gloss check in my dressing room, and there was a man peeing in my sink. <laughs> <laughs> he was peeing in my sink. And um, I don't know who he was. I think he was a ghost. <laughs> and then um, he came out, and, and Joe Brown was in the uh, thing next door. And I was like, oh, there's a man weeing. And she goes, oh, they'd never do that if it was a blooming male comedian's dressing room, which I agreed with. And then, um, and then so it was kind of, like, quite exciting. And um, what, the, was, we, the weeing? What, seeing the man Well, wing? it was... You know, sometimes you need something to jolt you out of yeah. your nerves and need to stick your face in some fire. Yeah. And um, then... Is that man weeing that? Is that seeing a man wee? For you, that is. That's like the seeing same. my face in fire. If he's got some cystitis. People, some people take. <laughs> some people take coke. You just say, can I have a weeing man? I need a weeing man <laughs> everywhere I go to, to just get rid of my who nerves. Who was this? Do not. You don't really make complain very much about stuff, as what I'm gleaning already. It's... I would have gone to the director of that show and said, there's a man, or a producer, and said, there's a man we in my dressing room. I don't really appreciate that so much. I, I kind of did. I, I did, but, it, but yeah. it is a... Yeah, I think there's a life skill I haven't learnt, which is complaining. And presumably there was a toilet in your dressing room as well. Do you know what there was? Yeah. But I think so, it's... So it's very hard to... But you know, you know when you're drunk, yeah. there's a sweet satisfaction in weeing somewhere you're not meant to oh, wee. Yeah, yeah. It's almost the point of being drunk sometimes. <laughs> um, was this man drunk? Why was there a drunk man backstage? <laughs> We've got no drunk men backstage here. Michael no, McIntyre's letting us down. He was, um, he was a drunk man, yeah. No. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, it's, it's all behind us now. That was the, now Ben Evans is going to hear that and hear all about him with men weeing and stuff. That was an inappropriate answer for but then an 11 the third, year old boy. The third Live at the Apollo I did, I was in a dressing room with um, Sarah Millican oh, yes. getting our makeup done. And I, because I, I was always that girl at school that didn't know what lesson she was meant to be in. My best mate Penny would tell me everything. Even tonight, Richard, I thought we were, we were finishing at eight. I know you did, yeah. And, and I was like, oh, right, okay. So I'd sort of slightly changed my plans because I never know what's going on. I turn up to things. And um, I said, how, how long are we doing? And she said, well, I'm doing 40. I didn't realise she was in a different recording to me and she was comparing, so she was doing 40 minutes. I was like, oh, right, shit, 40? I thought we were only doing 20 minutes. And so, like, with five minutes before I went on stage, I started cobbling together these jokes and writing these brand-new jokes. And I went out on Live at the Apollo and I was padding out. 
and, and like 20 minutes went, oh fuck, I've got another 20 minutes, I haven't got another 20 minutes I haven't done on TV. And then I came off and, and as you'll know, it's a crime to overrun a yeah. TV show, it's an absolute crime and everyone said, you know, you did double your time. And it was awful because it wasn't like I was smashing it doing double my time, I was kind of dying on my ass, I'll be honest with you. And uh, that, that was, um, I, I did spend a, about a week in a field in Halifax getting over that gig. Why, is that what you do when you've had a bad gig? I you do. I like to Halifax? sit, I, I like to go to Yorkshire when, yeah. I'm, when I'm really upset about things and I like to sit in fields, preferably near some kind of rusty tractor to make me feel old-fashioned and... And I sit and think and I phone my agent crying. Yeah. There's nothing like going to Halifax to make you realise how lucky you are. In <laughs> That's what I've, what I've discovered. My brother was born in Halifax, so I'm kind of allowed to do that. He supports Halifax Town. Imagine how embarrassing that is. Uh, Where so, were you born? I was born near York. Oh, I, look, how, look how smug you I are about you that. At York, I support York City, who are much better than Halifax Town. They beat uh, Portsmouth 4 2 this weekend. So, how, how come you're in different. Oh, God, that's a stupid question. I was going to say, how come you're born in different places, like you're twins? <laughs> <laughs> if you were twins, that would be of note. But actually, I mean, it's not that, moved. you know. It's Halifax and York as well. It's not like uh, beyond. <laughs> how did you put your family move so far in six years? <laughs> Says the woman who's come from Iran. Uh, so um, Iran again. Uh, my dad was uh, my dad was a teacher. And, you know, in Iran? In, no, in, in Yorkshire. Oh, right. If he'd been in Iran, that would have really been impressive. That he's, but he, you have to go back to Yorkshire to have your children like a salmon, <laughs> like a headmasterly salmon, spawning all over the place. So. Um, uh, last time I talked to you, in, in, I've just listened back to the Edinburgh Fringe podcast we did together which uh, was about halfway through the first series of the Edinburgh Fringe podcast, and I couldn't really remember much about it, and we were both, uh, we were both in a similar... I think you'd had two hours sleep and had some vodka, and I'd just been doing podcasts for... Uh, so we were both quite indiscreet. We were very... Uh, yeah, that, that was one of those things I just walked away from, thinking, I'll just leave that there. It was good. It was, it was funny. I was, I was, I'm, I'm, I'm running a half marathon next weekend, and so I was listening to it while I was running a half marathon. Oh, which one? Training for my half marathon. The Royal Park's half marathon. I'm doing that. Cool. See you there. See you right. I don't think you will see me there because you're quite fit, aren't you? Well, I had a baby three and a half oh, months ago, so I'll so, be walking a bit of it. So I should be able to take you on. Uh, <laughs> but I was laughing out loud and my wife was saying it was running with me. It was quite rude of me to be listening to a podcast. Uh, I was saying, you look mad laughing. You're laughing too loudly at that. And I said, but imagine if people knew I was just laughing at myself. <laughs> But I had, I never listen back to these things usually, and, I, and, uh, and so I had forgotten about it. Uh, the thing that made me laugh was me saying that Julius Awala smelt of my spunk. Uh, it's, worth, it's worth listening to, in context it made sense. In context. We were both very indiscreet, but you were talking about that too. I'm shyer uh, about talking about this in front of your lovely wife yeah. than you are. I know, she doesn't, she's used to it. Is that all right? So she's still laughing, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> When we get home, it'll be a different story. Yeah. <laughs> she beats me. How do you... <laughs> How do you know Julius Wahala? I went out with Julius I know Wahala. you did. <laughs> Just making you and she say she was it. in uh, Time Gentleman Police, my uh, sitcom I wrote. Oh, that's nice. Well, I think I was going out with her before she was in it. Yes, she was, yeah. Uh, so I, I, her just, father, I just put my girlfriend... Here's our link. Her yeah. father was uh, played my f uh, grandfather in my um, Little Cracker on Sky. Oh, yes, I was going to ask this. I haven't seen your Little Cracker. Uh, it's a, but, it's uh, a beauty. <laughs> it is. <laughs> uh, but it sounded good. You've got uh, Todd Carty was in it from Grange Hill. Yeah. So it was, was, it, was, it, was he playing... Tucker Jenkins or was he, he was playing uh, well he wasn't really in it till the very end there was okay. like a, just a little montage but I there was ruined a... it is, this, is it me like telling people what happens at the end of Breaking Bad which is uh, you won't believe what happens I think I'm the only person in the world that hasn't seen Breaking Bad I'm going to tell you and then I'm going to show people your face <laughs> as you find out if I press the wrong one I think it's one I wouldn't say <laughs> They take, there's drugs in it. There's some drugs in it. They've got drugs. You know, the meth lab. I literally said to him a few minutes ago. I'm not going to tell you. That would be just because I saw it this morning at nine o'clock. <laughs> Sorry, yes, you're so, your you're little cracker. Your little cracker. Let's go back to your little cracker. Um, yeah, Tucker Jenkins, that, that this, this kid uh, who's about, I think, well, he's about 18, but who's made to look like a, a young Tucker Jenkins. Right. And the, it was about me as a little kid having a massive crush on 
Tucker Jenkins. We all did. And telling all my friends that I knew him and I didn't know him and he came <laughs> to our school and everyone said, Oi, she reckons that um, you know her and he pretended to know me. Oh. Yeah, it was, a, it was a beautiful moment that I made up, sadly. But, oh. um, and then the real Todd Carter was the end of it and with photos of me like we got married. <laughs> and I, always, I was always madly in love with Todd Carter um, growing up and... It was a dream to meet him, and they even they, they did the program so. Perfectly. He's gone off the boil a bit though, hasn't he? Let's face it. He's a sweet. He's very funny. Okay. He's very funny, and uh, they even got a white Ford Cortina because that's the car that we had when we were kids, and me and Todd were sat in it to, to film a bit, and then something went wrong with the camera, and we were we were in this car for 45 minutes and with a childhood crush like five minutes is fun and jolly but 45 minutes with this actor's getting really fucked off that everyone's like no he was he was being very sweet but it was very awkward and uh, he's lovely he's still lovely he'll always be lovely he'll always, always be Tucker they're too young a lot of these people I just realised that you haven't got a clue what I'm talking you know, about I'm just you your grandmother at Christmas going oh he was a lovely fella do you know Tucker Jenkins James yeah flipping do you? it Tucker. how do you know how old are you, James? Wow, you look like 13 or something. I thought that was your mum. Uh, so, I'm joking. We've already established you're his wife. Much older wife. So, um... <laughs> It's, I'm, I'm, He's I'm just jealous because he wants to have sex with your husband. It is. I'm gonna have sex with him, I? Cool. <laughs> Very good. So you were, I saw, well, you were talking about this in, in our last podcast, that's why I brought it up, but you were talking about your, you had a rock star boyfriend that you talked about in your, in <laughs> yeah. your last show, your very good show uh, the, called, um, it is called Dirty Looks and Hopscotch. Dirty Looks and Hopscotch. I knew it had hopscotch it in it. Uh, but it was very, very, it was a brilliant show. It was a very it open was... and candid show yeah. and you were very open and candid in the last podcast. Yeah, I was. Yeah. I think, I think in the, uh, in the, th- Three and a half years that it took for me to get divorced. Yeah. I don't know if I was sort of o- o- overly candid because I needed to go through some stuff, or if it was the amount of alcohol <laughs> I was drinking to see me through the court cases. I don't know, but I was quite Tracy Emin for about three and a half years, <laughs> and the um, the rock star was really candid, like. He had no fourth wall at all, no brain to mouth filter, and he sort of made me really open, and he, he sort of made me see the world as he sees it, where it really doesn't matter how you are and how you act and what you say, and it was incredibly liberating. And I've, to my kind of, I'm a bit sad that I've gone back a little bit into a world where I don't really talk openly about the first time I went down on a woman and stuff like that. You know, yeah, it's I'm uh, a bit disappointed. I was hoping that was how I was going to get onto that. <laughs> I was going to get on that and then just. Film you very close up as you talk. To <laughs> um, but because in the there was a bit that made me go ah oh, and, and quite cross with him in the podcast because you, you obviously there was a lot of positive things from this relationship. But he said that he would shown his mates you on live at the Apollo with the sound turned down because oh, that was sound not turned important. Down. Yeah. And then uh, all his friends had said, and then he told you that what his friends had said was that you had fat calves. Yeah, hadn't got a big... No, what he said to me... A thing to say. And it was yeah, backstage. Boom. Oh, that boom wasn't the half of it. Oh, heavens above. No, gosh, if that gets booed, the rest of it will make you throw fish at his face. <laughs> um, yeah, he... Uh, I, I was about to go on stage as well. And you know what it's like when you're about to go on stage? You need happy thoughts, Absolutely. you know? And, and he said, oh, and, and I showed them. And they said... The rest of the band, they said, ain't you got big calves? But I'm looking at your calves now, and you're not skinny, skinny. <laughs> but you're normal. <laughs> and uh, and then I went, thank you very much, good evening. And like, you've oh, got very then. thin calves. Oh, bless your heart, it's all the running that we do, it is. you and I, Richard. How, how's your training? Are you, have you been properly training <laughs> no. for the half marathon? I'm really in a lot of pain today. I ran, I ran, <laughs> I ran 10 miles yesterday. Oh, uh, that's good. Yeah, but it hurts. I had to stop. Uh, I was going to do 11, but I had to stop at 10. But I think I'll be all right next week. Oh, you see, I'm really worried because I did a half marathon in Gen- before I had my kid and it was fine, like, did it under two hours. But I haven't... Um, I had a C-section, right? Nice. So I know you're really into talking about birth and I pregnancy. Am, yeah. um, and the, well, basically, it's like having major abdominal surgery. Yes, you shouldn't be running a half marathon. I shouldn't marathon be running a half, half marathon, marathon, but I've sort of... Um, um, yeah, I'm, I've committed to it now. I'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> Will you, will you give me a piggyback if I'm struggling? <laughs> if your intestines are coming out of your stomach. Oh, God! <laughs> I will do, yeah. I'm a bit... Do you know what? Okay, I'm going to be honest. You just said 
that you ran 10 miles yesterday. Yeah. And when you first said, I'm doing a half marathon at the weekend, I thought to myself, oh, well, if Rich is going to do it, then I'll be fine. I'm very fit. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I haven't done enough training and, the, and I'm, I'm quite old. So, yeah, well, I am. How, how this could be my last appearance. <laughs> this could be they just play this with sad music at the end. Oh. Richard Herring died. Sponsor him at You Virgin Money. Be good, like when you die doing it, you, can, you do raise like a million pounds. Don't you? So that's the, <laughs> who, who I look you? on the bright side. Who are you running for? Who's I'm running for Scope. For? Lovely. Yeah. Who are you running for? You're doing it for, just doing it for yourself. Bernardo's. Oh, Bernardo's, that's yes, nice. Yes, Bernardo's. Yeah. Lovely. There we are. That's all I have to say about that. Well, we'll sponsor us both. Uh, especially if either of us are dead or have given ourselves some kind of injury by not training enough. I might prolapse. You might do. <laughs> so, God, that could happen. Um, <laughs> do you know there's prolapse porn? Is <laughs> Sorry. Is this too far? I didn't know. There's nothing's too far on this podcast. Because I, I will tell you that while, while I was... Because I, I was single and pregnant, right? Yeah. And, uh, and when you're... Don't tell me you did some prolapse porn. As long as you just found out you found there's some prolapse porn. I was single, I had a couple of weeks off. It was a really weird thing. Some weird thing happened to me. I got, like, completely addicted to watching porn. Yeah. I'd never, ever watched it before. And, uh, and when I was pregnant, I don't know, maybe it was a hormonal thing, but, like, once you stop, you're, like, you're, start, you're like, oh, my gosh, what else can I find? And there's actual prolapse um, stuff. How did you find... How did you get... The, how did you... What was the journey that took you... To prolapse. Porn. I think I might have thought because it was on. Oh, it was on a site called X Hamster. I, I was okay. like, wow, you could type in anything. So I was like typing things like bogey. Yeah, this is be careful because this is what you know. A lot of celebrities have found that leads to some uh, terrible places. Oh yeah. I was yeah. researching a book. About, no, I no, I, about, I stopped at uh, prolapse. Oh Pro heavens, yes, yes. Um, yeah, edit that bit out. You know, yeah. you said there's bits, Shafi, that you could just tell me to <laughs> edit out. Gonna... This is not going to be in there. Okay. <laughs> this uh, is gold. Okay. <laughs> this is going to be on the international news. But your audience is so squeamish when yeah. I said prolapsing after pregnancy. Yeah, I wonder why. Pregnancy. I wonder what upset them about that. <laughs> I wasn't even sure what a prolapse was until I, I saw the porn. Right. <laughs> I didn't know what it meant. I thought it was something like a slip disc. <laughs> Oh, dear Lord, help me stop talking. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> oh, dear. So, um, I'm going to ask you an emergency question. That's a good time to ask an emergency question okay. to get out of... Uh, to get out of that. In fact, I like this is a new emergency question. Get out question of this hole. Based on <laughs> my direct... <laughs> it's not really a hole, is it? It's, uh... it's something else. It's, uh, it's an inverted hole. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any unusual phobias, like the lady who was scared of big statues? Um, That's good news. A new emergency question. What do you think? <coughs> yeah, just trying it out. See how it goes. No, I no. Don't, I'm okay. not. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. No. Uh, I've always wanted to be one of these people who are, who are really interesting and have yeah. a phobia of like nails. What, which kind of nails? It's nails. Either. Either, either you, like both. My best mate Penny, she oh, she's asked me never to say her name um, in public. <laughs> My best mate Genevieve, she um, is has a phobia of newspapers. Really? Anything print um, newspapers. And when we were kids, I used to like roll up newspaper and chase her around with it. <laughs> and she once fainted. <laughs> uh, but no, that's a very real phobia. So yeah. I'm, I'm interesting by proxy. I don't really like polystyrene being rubbed together. I don't think it's quite a phobia, but it does No, no one me. likes that. Uh, and one of the other people, and there was a very small crew that we took to um, in here, but the, one of the cameramen was, had a phobia of people scrunching their feet up on carpet. Okay. And it made him sick. It made him vomit if that happened. <laughs> It's weird. Yeah, it's all came out on the first night. I thought it was a risk. I had to move things. places on the tube because someone was chewing their gum too loudly. You know, people yeah. just sit there and, and they don't do it continue. They just go. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I can't. I can't even sit. I've dated people that were perfect for me in every other way, but then you have a meal with them and <laughs> can't have yeah. sex with that. It's like the, the snotting back in the throat that, that happens a lot. The kind of when it's really viscous and they're kind of gargling in the back of their throat. Like, <laughs> snot cappuccino. 
That's, that's not nice. I was on the tube the other day and there were two men who were like about 55. They weren't kids. And you know, they were playing on their phones. They were playing a game on their phone, like a driving game with the sound on. And I was sitting right next to this guy and I just kept on looking at him. And then I thought, shall I, shall I say something about this? Or if I say, is that what he's doing it for? So I say, you know, why are you playing a fucking driving game? You're 55. And turn the fucking sound out. You're on the tube. Fucking, Did you not say anything? Didn't say anything because I was scared he would sp spike me in the face with a knitting needle. Ah. Uh, <laughs> were, were they uh, were they rough sorts or were they? They weren't. They weren't. Just, but you know, you just sort of think. You just think, is it worth the risk? Everyone was looking at him, going. But he's, yeah. there's obviously something a bit crazy about him if he's doing that. I think. Don't you? There's something a bit odd about. Yeah, him. Yeah, I always say something. I, I'm. Do you know? Oh I went. Um, I've recently moved back to my native Ealing, and everywhere I go, I see. Um, little landmarks of my pregnancy alter altercations. <laughs> I, I had loads when I was pregnant, just like really, just any issue you have, you have to bring it up. Yeah. Um, and I would have said something, or I would have started singing really loudly. <laughs> I've done that before to teenagers, just going, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me, although he's far away. And then um, I think, well, if you make me listen to your tinny, crappy music, you're going to have to listen to mine. Absolutely fair enough. I yeah. agree. Um, what is the closest you have ever come to physically die, actually dying in real life? Last week. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes, last week I was in um, uh, Kruger National Park in um, South Africa, yep. and I was tracking a rhino by foot. My feet, my yeah. own feet. Yeah. And uh, I was holding the tracker's hand, and it was, it was a real heart and mouth. <laughs> it, was, it was scarier than, I thought Live at the Apollo was scary, but being very close to a wild rhino that's staring right at you was absolutely petrifying in the most exhilarating way I felt alive. And if you were the motherfucker who stole my phone in Marks and Spencer's a few days ago with all of my safari photos, please give them back. Has there ever been a more middle-class statement than that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, well, I've stole my diamond shoes are too tight. <laughs> I'm very sorry to hear about your phone. That is a terrible thing. You weren't All backed right. up. No, I wasn't backed if anyone up. Anyone see Shappy's face? So it's got pictures of rhinoceros. It's on got it. rhino pictures. My son's sixth birthday pictures. Oh. A holiday in Cornwall and a bloke from Leeds's cock. <laughs> <laughs> this bloke from Leeds. Not in one photo though. <laughs> I can't laugh too loudly here because one of these flies will go in I'm my mouth. Very, I feel very embarrassed about the flies. I do. I just, the, it's just does, that doesn't happen, does it, on Parkinson and Graham? Because he doesn't do one anymore. And Graham Norton and stuff, they don't have a fly. Two flies. It's like, but it's like a little ballet, a fly ballet is going on for people who like it. So for any insects watching, that will be what is interesting. Oh, look at the courtship of those two flies. And we're the, just in the background. Yeah. We're supporting artists. We're, kind of, like, yes. we're, we're supporting everyone. I'll ask, what, what, what do I have? I have to ask this. This is an emergency question that I have to ask. I'm not quite tired of it yet. We haven't got long left. Um, if you had to choose between having, is that how it goes? Uh, it, would you prefer to have, I can't remember how to do it. If you had to choose between having a hand made out of ham, uh, or that's fucking fly. <laughs> it does add a new uh, dimension to the question. <laughs> Fuck off! Being attacked by a fly. And it's, my, it's like my hand is made out of ham. <laughs> <laughs> visual element there. Yeah, that's good. Anything you can do visual is good. If you had to choose between having a hand made out of ham or an armpit that dispensed sun cream. Which of those two things would you have? The hand will grow back if you eat it, but slowly. Uh, you can only get like maybe two bottles of sun cream a year out of your armpits. <laughs> but you can only have one of those two things. You ask any, any it, questions you like. Will it grow back again ham or my flesh? <laughs> Good question. Uh, I didn't think there would be any new ground within this question, <laughs> but you have found it. It would grow back as ham. It would always be ham from there on. Once you've made that, you could not go back to non-ham ham. <laughs> Oh, no, I'd have to have the, the dispenser, yeah. sun cream dispenser. Yeah. If I don't, is it like breast milk? Like, if I don't use it, it'll dry up. <laughs> <laughs> is that what happens? It just stops going. It doesn't literally if just become don't... desiccated. You know. <laughs> they don't get 
like a powder milk. <laughs> oh, stop it. Like talcum powder coming up. <laughs> Quite useful. Would you rather have a hand made out of ham, an armpit that dispenses sun cream, or a tit that dispenses talcum powder? <laughs> unlimited, would be unlimited talcum powder. Yeah, I, I like really... talcum powder tit. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be a surprise, wouldn't it? When you stripped off. Yeah. I'm, too po- <laughs> I'm too postnatal for this. <laughs> um, so yeah, we'll go for, we'll go for um, talc tip. That is the new question. That is the new question. Don't listen to him. <laughs> um, so we're, here we are in season four of uh, Rahul Estepa. <laughs> well done. Um, you did your first Edinburgh show you did with Russell Brand, previous guest on Rahul Estepa. Yes, I did. Yeah, how was that? Back in 2000 or 1999 or 2000? I think it was 2001 or something. 2001, I think 2001 it was. 2001 or two, yeah, really early on. In a triple hander. In a triple hander, me, Russell Brand and Marta Felgate. And, um, okay. and it, he rang me up and he goes, oh, Charlie, you want to like, do this show? And he sorted everything out. And I had no idea. I was so naive. I'm very naive about certain things. Yes. I, I used to be very naive. And then he said, uh, oh, do you want to go for a drink? And I was like, yeah, I'll go for a drink. And he had no money, so I bought him a Bacardi and Coke that I'm, you know, will remember forever. <laughs> and, uh, and he went, so, Shappy, are you, uh, are you putting yourself about a bit this festival? <laughs> that and right. And then I went, well, now, now you know what he means by that. Now that we know Russell, we know <laughs> what he means. And I said, well, um, I've invited a few agents to come and see me, and I'm doing a few extra shows. But other than that, really, it's just our show and just having fun and seeing what the festival's like and seeing lots of theatre. That, and then he just looked at me like, you are so not worth fucking. <laughs> you will never shut up. <laughs> so um, I was the only woman in Edinburgh that year that didn't have sex with Russell. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Imagine if you put him off women. Imagine if that had been the moment. Look, I'm going to have to go to men. Uh, could have, could have been. Why amazing. would he have done that? Now I can understand that comment, com- comment, comment. Yes. If he was now gay. Yeah, but he isn't. But so he's he not. Didn't. So no, why? Because you I didn't think... imagine that he did. That's what I said. That's why I didn't. <laughs> it didn't work. Let's just move on. <laughs> no, I'm just a bit sensitive about that because at university I was madly in love with my friend. And uh, came out of the closet shortly after university, and um, he went out with a girl called. And I was so jealous and sad. And I went to a 40th birthday party last week where people from my university were there, the ones that I hadn't kept in touch with. And all the old dynamics were back. And I was having a fag outside, I don't even smoke. Um, And this started going, oh yes, you know, well, Shappy was with the, well, you were madly in love with him, weren't you? Well, when Shappy and I bonded, because then I went out with him, didn't I? Then I went out with him, and you were madly in love with him. And I was like, that's fucking painful memories, actually. <laughs> and then I said to my friend that I was with, it was like, you know, quite, you know, she's carrying a, a few extra pounds now. And I, I said to my friend, you know what, she hasn't let herself go. She was always like that. Um, <laughs> And so that's just a horrible part of my nature that I've just told you. It is. <laughs> yes, it's, a, it's a shame, really. Uh, I was. Can I change the names in in the stories I tell? Yeah, you can, but all right. You know, it was... you have to do it at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's you want us to dub on different. <laughs> Could you in, in a Mexican just, just accent? Different ones. <laughs> Like uh, Luigi. I'll, I've and, got to ask you this question because uh, yes. Ben Evans will be furious. I don't know if there's a hidden agenda behind this. I don't, I don't think there is. He's a very sweet uh, child. Do you know how to speak in Persian? Don't answer yet. And if so, what is I have an orange fingernail in Persian? Um, well, the language is Farsi okay. or Persian. Actually, Fucking hell, no, ben. no, both is good. Both is good. We'll go with Persian. Okay. I have an orange fingernail. No, I have an orange fingernail. Okay, the answer is yes. Vamanya angushin khune naranji dara. Okay. I don't know why he wanted to know that. I don't know if the, you know. It's sort of like an overtone of it spinning up someone's bum. Uh, I don't think he was thinking that. I think it was just a sort of surreal a bit of nonsense from an 11-year-old Welsh boy, but at least you've answered his question. There we are. I'm glad, I'm glad to have I'm made glad. someone's dreams come true. Um, and so I also very much enjoyed your book, A Beginner's Guide to Acting English. I don't like the title. No. I, I love my book, but they made me have that title. Yes. I'm very upset about the title. I don't tell people about my book because I don't like saying the title. 
Beginner's Guide to Acting English. What a <laughs> dumb ass title they forced me to have. Again, I didn't want to complain. I wanted to call it um, English People Smell of Milk. Yes. <laughs> but do, apparently, we that, well, of dairy. That's what the Chinese said. That's what I used to think when I was a kid. I was like, I want to be English. I want to smell of milk. But I didn't. I smell of coriander and parsley. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we ate. Because at school, no one likes to talk about this, but at school in the 80s, everyone in London, um, Ealing, everybody smelt of, of what they ate at home. Mm-hmm. I don't know what some people were doing eating cocoa butter, but, you know, uh, and we all... We all um, and there was, there was no shame in that. I don't mind smelling of coriander. No. I do mind smelling of milk. Though, oh, was it offensive? Yeah, I'm very, I'm very offended, but I do smell of milk. I've, no, I've never noticed it until uh, I did have that conversation with you before. And, um, yeah, we do smell of milk. I've, sp- I've smelled myself a few times smelling of milk now. Oh, but I, I smell like of milk, milk now. Yeah, I mean, I was... right now. <laughs> so... Dried up, isn't it? Talcum powder now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, when you were... Because Ben asked this question as well. When you were a kid, you had to... You lived in Iran, but you had to leave Iran because your dad was a satirist and he'd upset the Ayatollah. He was a satirist, yeah. Satirist. <laughs> he upset uh, the Ayatollah. And, the um, thing is, to be fair, it wasn't a hard thing to do. You sort of cough in the wrong tone and they get a bee in their bonnet. They do, and they've got those big they've bonnets as big well. They've got big bonnets. So it's... <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so you had quite enough that you were there was a fact there was a fatwa against your no uh, there wasn't it was not, no okay. that's Wikipedia they, they won't take that down right um, there wasn't a fatwa because it wasn't from a religious point of view like my dad was never um, he was never religious folk were never after him right. for, for for being blasphemous can I, can I just stress that repeatedly throughout this podcast yes. he has never said anything bad about any religion he respects all religion uh, uh, Peter, oh god <laughs> honestly the fear once once someone tries to do like kill your family um, when you're 11 it never quite leaves you <laughs> that feeling of at any moment someone might put a bomb under your car never quite leaves you but that's the job of terrorists isn't it? It's it is. to inflict terror. It is. And we were terrified. Thanks for bringing it oh, up. I'm sorry. Well, I was, when you were a kid, you had to look under... You were, you we did have to look the, under the car for bombs. But you and didn't not, know what... What they looked like. <laughs> My dad, like, you know, remember, like, the only bomb we'd know if it was, like, very round with a big fuse <laughs> with B-O-M-B written on it. Other than that, my dad's not a mechanic. He's a poet. He's like, I don't know, I know. Just get in, turn on the ignition, close your eyes, see if it's... All right, and it <laughs> and it was. Did he ever make you turn on the ignition? <laughs> Just get in there, Shafi. Um, no, of course not. Of course he wouldn't. Have done that. Of course he wouldn't have done that. That would be awful. It's a fantastic book. Do read it if you get the chance. Oh yeah, the book's good. It is good. Yeah, I've just learned off the title. Yeah. Yeah, the actual book. Don't good. read the title. But read everything else in it. Just close your eyes and read it, and and uh, yeah, <laughs> read the acknowledgements. I especially like the acknowledgements of my book. Oh yes. Just went on and on and on. They're about seventeen pages because I thought <laughs> this is my chance to thank everyone for everything. I thank people that did nothing for my book. <laughs> anyway. Todd Carty. Todd Carty's there. Yeah. <laughs> he ghost wrote my book. <laughs> Good to see. Um, Right, uh, Mike Stoner wants you to know that your name is an anagram of Posh Kids Piranha. Lovely. That's all, that's all he's got to say <laughs> about you. Uh, you've done a lot, I mean, you have done a wide variety of TV shows. I was, I was watching you with Andrew Neil, who is a fucking prick. Is he? Don't you think so? You've talked I don't, to him. like, I don't, I don't know. I think I try to see the good in everybody. Do you? <laughs> It was you, Andrew Neil, and Michael Portillo. And that sounded Bloke. far more syrupy than I meant it to. <laughs> by the way, it's just I don't, I don't, I know you well enough. But I don't know you well enough to, to to share that sentiment. But Michael Portillo was quite unpleasant. I thought on that thing, he made some comment. I thought you were a com- you'd said something serious. And he went, "Oh, I'm waiting for the joke." I thought you were a comedian. Oh, did he? Oh, yeah. he's he's actually um, quite all right to chat to off right. stage. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Yeah. I mean, they've, they've, got a, they've got a really... They've just got a talk at night and they all... There's lots of wine drunk on yes. that show before... During and before one during. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Andrew Neil comes out and checks Twitter straight away, checks all his trolls. Um, yeah. It's a, I, the worst thing, it's called This Week, isn't it, this programme? 
they always sort of do a sort of amusing sketch at the top of the show. Yeah, I've done a few of those amusing really... sketches. Ooh. Yeah, I mean they try and do a, they, they try and keep it light, don't they? Well, the, the, the person I objected to being on that was Alistair Campbell. It's incredible that this man has a television career. I mean, he's on more comedy panel shows than I am, and I didn't even invade anyone. It, it, it's, it, it's something I can't quite uh, get my head around, um, that, that he's out there and not, you know, in prison. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and, uh, yes, you did, uh, you did also did, uh, well, I quite like done Question Time, Let's Dance. I did that twice, yeah, Question and, Time twice. And, <gasps> so nervous. I can't even, oh, yeah. Well, it's kind of an odd one when comedians go on it, though, sometimes. Is it? Well, I've do you think so? It's... Well, yeah, I think Were it you fairly serious? Be. I didn't see them. I was quite serious, yeah. yeah. But the, the first time I went on it was great because I hadn't done any telly, really. And so, and, the, and Twitter didn't exist. But the second one, it did exist, and I had done a bit more telly, and it just felt a little bit like, like I'm out there with my opinions. And, you try, and the thing is about question time is the people that are really used to doing it, they will say any old shit, and they know the rhythm to speak in to get that applause at the end, I eat fish. Everyone starts clapping, right? Thank you. And I, I, I wasn't, I'm not used to doing that, so I would sort of be, start quite earnest and then realise that I was talking for far too long and someone had interrupted me and I was like, oh, jeez, it's like being on Mock the Week. <laughs> um, but uh, that was the, the great time, seven years ago. Anyway, so let's move on. Okay. Question time. Well, yes. I'll, we, can, we can move on. I'll ask we don't you, have to move on. I'll ask you a final question. Have you um, uh, ever... I saw uh, an old Italian man getting a blowjob in a railway siding. <laughs> What, have you ever seen any alfresco sex from other people? Apart from, you've seen a man weeing in a, in a basin, I don't think that counts, it has to be with someone else. Um, have you ever seen an unusual sexual encounter? I haven't, no. Has anyone seen you <laughs> being involved in one? It seems to be where we're going next. Where, where was this railway line? It was in there. <laughs> <laughs> Was it Keith Allen? Uh, so, <laughs> could have been. Uh, no, no. No, I haven't ever um, seen anyone have sex no. that in public, ever. No. Oh, yes, I have. I went to a sex show in Amsterdam. Does that Was count? It? Yeah, not really. No, it's, no. Not, it's not quite the same. It doesn't even count as real sex. It's so weird and sanitised. <laughs> it's clearly all set up. <laughs> There's a stage, there's lights, there's all sorts of shit. No, it's no fun. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't quite count as the same. Uh, have you ever seen a Bigfoot? <laughs> well, I'm a size seven and I'm yes. five foot two. Yeah. Does that count? That doesn't count. Okay, uh, have I ever seen a Bigfoot? No. No. Uh, we do, have you ever seen a ghost apart from the ghost of the Hammersmith Apollo? No, I really wanted to see a ghost. Yeah. When my grand died, I thought, oh, may maybe this will be the time when I'll be proved wrong that there's a god and she'll come to me. In ghost form, I don't think that did. proves there's a god. I think that proves there isn't a god, and that all our souls are left wandering the earth in pain and. <laughs> oh no! But no it shows heaven. that there's something, though. It shows that there's something supernatural. Yeah, just like people wandering the earth, going, oh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> "That's all there is." Then that'd be awful to know that. No, so but that, that she didn't. She was fine. But she's she up did... in heaven. She's fine. Yeah, no, she's fine. She was proper gone. <laughs> she's, got, she's got her feet up. She's not going to come back in. No, but um, I am life. scared of ghosts, though, even though I don't believe in them. I'm petrified of them. Petra, sometimes I have to leave my own house and sit in the garden in the daytime. <laughs> and I'm, I'm so scared of <laughs> ghosts that I started writing ghost stories, but I freaked myself out. So I've, I've got about um, five quarter-written ghost books, ghost stories... Which you're, too scared, you're too scared I'm to too finish, scared them, to finish off. them They must be good, though. That's pretty I get good. the EBGBs. <laughs> yeah. You should put them out as the ghost stories that are too terrifying to finish. <laughs> and that's sort of more scary than a finished one, because it's like, fuck, something really bad happens now. I can't... The person who's writing this is no dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I, 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 yeah, so, um, so I, I, I'm yet to see a ghost. OK. That's, it's good to know. When you, are, when you are a ghost, you'll see loads of ghosts. Or you know, you oh, might be a ghost be a already ghost. and not know you're a ghost, and all oh, the people you no. see are ghosts already. Oh, well, then that's fine then, because then the, the indiscreet stuff I've said now yeah. won't matter. It won't matter because it still goes out as a podcast. That's what happens at the end of Sixth Sense. 
bang! <laughs> Ruined it for you. And at the end of Breaking Bad. Uh, so, they were all ghosts. They were all ghosts. They were, they were all ghosts. They were all ghosts. All the dead people come back. They go, hey, come on in. You were dead all along. You died of cancer right at the beginning. Well, come on in. Hey. That is literally what happens. There's no point in watching it now. I've wrecked it for you. Should I just tell, can I just tell you one thing? It's like Christmas. It's like Christmas Eve, you're allowed to open one present. And the present is... This will be nothing for the people. Everyone at home will have seen it already, because this is coming out next week. Does Todd die? You don't want to know, don't tell her, don't tell her, don't, don't tell her. Don't tell me anything. The, 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 Todd Todd's the dead life guy? or death is uh, uh, crucial to the whole thing. You don't like him. Well, what do you think? Do you think Todd dies? Or do you think, what do you think? Do you think he will die? Do you think he will die or he won't die? Got a, got a surprise coming up for you <laughs> when he doesn't die. Uh, so, <laughs> see, sorry. Well, I can't believe after all that. Sorry, Shappy, to break, I know you've got to go. It's awful. I believe after I don't all watch of that, you go. Tell, I don't know does Todd die? About. Don't tell me anything. Does Todd die? <laughs> <laughs> what happens just at the right of the end? Just tell me that. <laughs> That's all I want to know. I've never seen Breaking Bad. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Look, we, uh, you've got to go and do some stuff, so I can't, I can't hold uh, you up any longer. Oh. So it's been you're having fun. It'd be like we can, I've, I've we had can, lots of fun. You can come back another time. I'll Will try you... and do it without flies next time. Yeah. I am embarrassed. Is with I feel, I feel embarrassed that we're flies. Oh, I've had fun. I always Maybe. like talking to you. I love talking to you. You're fantastic. Will you please give a massive round of applause to Shabby Kosandi, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Welcome to Shabby Here you go. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs> oh, hello. Sorry, that was the end of the show. What is this tune? It sounds like the Zed Cars opening titles. It's like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, but it's different. I don't know what it is. It's driving me insane. I have to listen to it a lot. Um, being a dad is great. Have children. Whoever you are, go out, find someone, have children with them. It's amazing. Don't look at me and think his life's falling apart. Uh, I'm just looking at my little baby there. She's looking at her own hand. This is the most amazing thing in the world. And uh, there we go. Put the toys up so she can... Now she's looking at the toys. That's better. Oh, she's seen her friend the lion. It's made her smile. How sweet. Yeah, you're one of those cynical people who doesn't like this kind of thing. And well done to you. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, there'll be more again next week. Uh, we are trying to film... Even more of these, which will go up for free. Uh, so if you can't afford to pay for them, hopefully if other people will pay for them, you will still get to see them. But join in our Kickstarter campaign or come see me on tour. Uh, and Or just, you know, tell your friends about this show. Or of course you can buy a badge if you prefer. All the badge money, by the way, will now be going towards a future videoed monthly as it occurs to me. So if you want that to happen... Go to gofasterstrike.com slash badges, donate a pound or more a month, and hopefully we'll soon have enough money to do that as well. Thank you for all your contributions. Uh, this is your show. It belongs to you, and you decide whether it continues or not, and I quite like that about it. Okay. I better go and look after my child. <coughs>